Peace be to you. Once upon a time, there were two tadpoles amusing themselves under the water. One little tadpole said to the other, I think I'll stick my head up and see if there's anything in this world besides water. The other tadpole said, don't be stupid. There's only what we know, just water. And so we often wonder, is there any wisdom, is there any power above the wisdom of the human intellect and above the power of the human will? There is, and that's what we're going to talk about. As there's something else in the world besides water, there's something else in the world besides human nature or poor, weak human nature, and that is grace. Grace is not the name of a girl. Grace is this higher wisdom, higher power that can come to us. It really is not a very good name because it just means gratis. It merely means that it is free. We cannot merit it in a strict sense, but it appears repeatedly in the New Testament. In the Greek, its name is charis, and it is to be counted about 150 times. Now, if there is another life above the purely natural or the human, then it is possible for every Christian to lead a double life. Yes, a real double life. Natural life, a divine life. A human life, a spiritual life. Somewhere in the book of the Apocalypse we read, you call yourselves living, and yet you are dead. That means you are biologically alive, but you are spiritually dead. We are constantly bumping up against walking corpses on the street. They seem to be alive. Their body, their soul is dead. As the life of the body is the soul, so the life of the soul is grace, or the partaking of the divine life. Now, before we come to an understanding of what this divine life is and where it comes from, let us picture a three-story house. There's a cellar the first floor, and the second floor. The cellar, always a kind of a dark place where there is thrown a lot of refuse. First floor, fairly comfortable, and the second floor is magnificent. Now, these three stories correspond to the three kinds of lives that men may lead. The cellar corresponds to the life of the senses and emotions, food, drink, carnal pleasure, and the like. I'm not saying these things are wrong. It just merely is a form of culture. It is what has been called by the great Harvard professor Sorokin, the sensate culture. He says that is the culture of our time, incidentally. Now, on the first floor, which is far more noble, we might call the floor of reason, science, of art, of humanism, of culture, namely all the things that make life really refined. That's not all. There is another story, and that's the floor of grace, where there is a higher intellect, stronger will, new powers, new love. Now, there are some people who live on the, in the cellar who say, well, I'm satisfied here. They are the kind of spiritual dropouts. They refuse to walk up to the first floor and to enjoy those cultural pursuits which give man so much joy. And then there are those who live in the first floor of humanism and reason and science and art who say, well, in order to get up to that top floor, I have to walk, don't I? I have to put forth a little effort. I refuse to do that. Why, when I play golf, I always go around the golf course on an electric cart. I'm satisfied. You tell me there's great joy and peace and happiness on the third floor. How do I know? I've never been up there. And then I'm not going to endanger my heart by walking in. Well, that's the attitude not only of those who live in this realm of the senses, but also those who live in the realm of reason. You know, the tragedy of life is not so much what people suffer, it's what they miss. That's the great sadness. Well, we've not yet defined grace. The Catechism defines it as a supernatural gift of God bestowed on us by Jesus Christ to save us. We will take out one word, supernatural. Well, the supernatural means the third floor in relationship to the second and the first. But it needs a, still a more of an explanation. Before me, as I talk to you, is a microphone. Just suppose this microphone before me suddenly started to bloom. Does it belong to the nature of a microphone to bloom? It certainly does not. If, however, it suddenly burst into flower, that would be a supernatural thing for a microphone. 
Let us take another example. As I am talking to you, I am in my study. I have always arranged my study so that I look into my chapel. That is in order that I may study and work in the presence of our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. On the altar of my chapel, there are flowers. Now suppose some of the flowers on the altar have suddenly began to walk on their stems. And they walked out through our little chapel, and they came here into my study, and those flowers stood before me, and each one of their little petals bowed down and saluted me. Does the power of movement belong to a flower? It certainly does not. This gift, or it would be a gift, note, exceeds the nature and the power and the needs of a flower. In other words, it would be a supernatural gift. Now, there's no dog here, but I used to have a dog, incidentally, and I used to teach the dog to fast. If I would hold out a piece of meat before the dog and say it was Lent, the dog would not touch it until I said Easter. Well, it took a long time to get that into the dog. That was not a supernatural act for a dog. But suppose any dog came into me as I am talking to you now, and uh, the dog listened to me for a moment, and he would suddenly say, say, you missed a good point there. You should have quoted the uh, Primus Secundi of St. Thomas at this point. And I think, too, if you had brought in this quotation from Shakespeare, it would have helped you very much. Does it belong to the nature of a dog to speak and to reason? This exceeds the nature and the power and the needs of a dog. And therefore, if it ever did that, it would be a supernatural act for a dog. Now let's come to man. Every man is a creature of God. He's a creature of God because he has been made. Suppose I suddenly became a child of God, so that not just the life of my parents, the life of God came into me, so that my reason had another light than just the light of reason. And my will had other powers than just my poor, weak human will. Why, that gift would be just as much above my human nature as blooming to a microphone, as walking to a road, and as speech to a dog. If I became a new creature, so that the body and the blood of Christ somehow was in me, that would be, in the strict sense, a supernatural gift. I say gift. I certainly do not deserve it. And furthermore, when that gift comes, it always changes our direction. Because by our nature, we are weak and we tend to sin and to doubt and to selfishness and the like. If we are to change our direction, a new power is needed. If I take, for example, a ball and throw it across the room, the ball will continue in a straight line unless some superior power diverts it. And so, too, natural human beings continue in certain directions, like Paul would have continued his persecution. Sinners would continue in their sin. Agnostics would continue in their doubt, unless some superior power intervened, and that is the power of grace. I'll take, for example, one example of the changing of direction. The editor, rather the former editor of the Communist Daily Worker of London, and his wife were one night listening to a radio program by a commissar of Russia. And suddenly the wife got up and shut off the radio, and she said to her husband, now remember they both were communists, I don't believe he wants peace, I think he wants war. He's talking peace, but he means war. She said, he said, don't talk that way. You're not talking like a communist. She said, I don't care what I'm talking like. He said, if you continue to talk that way, I shall report you to the party. She said, report me. Why, he said, you're beginning to talk as if you might become a Catholic. She said, I am. He said, shake. So am I. Now, here was a husband and wife living together, sharing communist ideas. And suddenly they both changed, unknown to one another. What did it? Power outside of us, power of grace. There's no such thing as just becoming better and better in the natural order, and then suddenly, in the strict sense, the very strict sense, meriting grace. No, nature and grace are quite distinct. It really is the difference between making and begetting. When you make anything, you make something that is unlike you. For example, you make a table. But the table does not share your nature. When parents beget a child, they beget something like themselves. Now, when God made us, 
God was our creator. But when he begets us as creatures, no, when he begets us rather as children, then he's not just our creator, then he is our father. And when grace comes into us, as our blessed Lord said, the same sap that passes through the branches passes through the vine, and the same sap in the vine passes through the branches. In other words, we begin to share the nature of our blessed Lord, so that he pours out his nature upon us. As St. John said, of his fullness we have all received. But when we respond to grace, then we become, well, something like a pencil in the hand. Pencil in the hand, as long as it is directed by the hand, will do anything the hand wants. And we are the instruments of God, and we obey his will just as the pencil obeys the will of the hand. When there is total obedience, that means sanctity. That's what a saint is. A saint is one who is as available to God as a pencil is to my hand. Now, what does grace do to our human nature? Well, first of all, it makes the body a temple of God. That is one of the reasons for purity. What is a temple? A temple is a place where God dwells. Remember when our blessed Lord went into the temple of Jerusalem and the Pharisees asked for a sign, our blessed Lord said, destroy this temple and in three days I will rebuild it. He was not speaking of that earthly temple. He was speaking of the temple of his body because in that human nature of Christ, God dwelt. Now, by participation of that divine life, he dwells in us. Now, that's why the body is sacred. That's why we have reverence for him. The body is not a worm, something vile. It's his temple. One day it will be glorified too. But the principal effects of grace are in the intellect and in the will. Now, the intellect is that faculty of ours by which we know. The will is, is that faculty by which we choose. The object of the intellect or reason is truth. The object of the will is goodness or love. When grace comes into the intellect, it comes as a kind of a light. It is rather difficult to describe what it does to the human mind. Well, picture sunlight shining through a stained glass window. Notice how it is diffused and brings out all of the cup. Well, that's what grace does to the intellect. It gives it a new vision. Faith then becomes to reason something like the telescope is to the eye. It does not destroy the eye. It just perfects it. And when faith gets into us, it gives us a new certitude, quite beyond reason. All that you get in these instructions and records of mine are merely motives of credibility. But I do not give you certitude. That has to come from faith. That has to come from God. That is why our blessed Lord said to Peter, flesh and blood hath not revealed this to thee, but my Father who is in heaven. And the certitude that comes from faith is so great that nothing can destroy it. As a matter of fact, the certitude that comes from faith is greater than the reasons for faith. That's because the light comes from God. We often have many certitudes that are stronger than the reasons we can give. For example, if we were challenged all of a sudden to prove that we were legitimate children, it might be rather difficult. We do not have the document, but nothing could shake that certitude. And so a learned man could give many reasons against the existence of God and the divinity of Christ to one of our children, but he could never destroy the faith of that child. Not only does faith give that certitude, but it also gives us a new outlook. A new outlook on birth, suffering, death, joy, pleasure, literature, art. Those who have what St. Paul calls the carnal man, or rather the carnal mind, cannot understand the things of faith. Very much like trying to make a blind man understand color. And very often those who lack the gift of faith wonder, why is it that we are, are so certain? Why do we have this outlook on suffering? Why are we not depressed? Why do we not contemplate suicide? Well, it's simply because we see things very much better. We have a light that they have not. Perhaps we've already said, but it bears repeating, that we have the same eyes at night as we have in the day. But we do not see at night. Why? Because we lack the light of the sun. And so let two people look out on the same problem. They see it very differently it's because one has only his reason and his senses and the other has faith. But there's also the human will. 
Now, when grace comes into the will, it gives us new power, new strength that we never had before. It gives us a new ability to resist temptation. Too often in this world, as soon as anyone becomes a slave of sin, we speak of him as having a compulsion. We say, oh, he is a compulsive drinker. He is a compulsive eater. Now, that is true. The word that our blessed Lord used to explain that compulsion was uh, slavery. But this does not mean that these people have completely destroyed their freedom. Believe me, there's always a little area of freedom left in an alcoholic and in a pervert and in anyone who was given to the slavery of sin. These sins which started with free acts of our own, they have weakened our will, but they have not completely destroyed. It is possible for grace to establish a beachhead. Grace has its D-Day. God can get in to any one of these people. And after all, when we're trying to cure people of vices, we can never drive out a vice. We can only crowd it out. How do you crowd it out? You crowd it out by putting something else that isn't you. The grace of God comes in. When we begin to love him, then these vices begin to be pushed out more and more and more. Once a new love comes in, we are changed. I remember once dealing with an alcoholic woman, and I said to her, you love alcohol more than anything else in the world. And because you do love alcohol anything more than anything else in the world, I can't cure you until you begin to love something else more. So we prayed for grace, and grace came in, and she was cured. Now this is what grace does to the poor, weak human will. And then it also gives power so that we influence others. Now if there's any influence, for example, in these words of mine, you may have been listening to these records for many hours. If I have any influence on you, if I have changed you, it is not because of any knowledge that I possess and not because of any power that I possess. If I have any influence on you, because the Spirit and the grace of God are working on you. My words are nothing. Of course, I did not begin these instructions without a prayer that the Spirit and the grace of God might give me strength. But if at any time you were changed, do not say, oh, Bishop Sheen, we're so grateful to you. Bishop Sheen did nothing. I am only the poor instrument of the good Lord. That's all. A very poor one. So if you are changed, there's the difference now between your nature and grace. Because before grace comes, you act in your own way. After you receive grace, you act in his way. That's the difference. Your conscience becomes quickened. And what before was so very precious to you now seems as nothing. And what before seemed as so much draw, now to you is precious. That's grace. Grace is that supernatural power that illumines your mind to see things above reason. It's that supernatural power which strengthens your will to do things which before you could not do. It changes you from a creature into a child of God. And most of all, it enables you to call God.